Norm is our presenter tonight, and our class, even though you can't see it, but it's uh, <laughs> our class is, what is it called? Tracing Your Lineage. <laughs> Um, Tracing Your Lineage, and Norma is one of the directors and, and organizers and, and really does so much for our group, the Lakes Region Genealogy Group, and so she helps keep us all in line, um, and she does a tremendous job. She also is not very involved in the DAR, Daughters of the American Revolution, and she's a registrar for her chapter and is involved in lots of other um, lineage societies and um, is a good person to ask questions to because she has a lot of, lot of expertise in the area. So we're excited to hear tonight her presentation. Welcome. And while Dee is escorting our lovely visitors out. We're gonna talk a little bit about the golden rules of genealogy. And I'll make this short, but I think it's, it's kind of fun to remember that spelling doesn't count, <laughs> that you assume nothing, and these are just little rules that you can take and, and share and use. Use discretion. Never lie in your genealogy. Some of us go online and we find things that are in error, or we meet with people that tell us tall tales, sometimes our family. Right? Mm -hmm. So don't assume that everything that you hear or you read is the truth. Do your digging, do your documentation, but enjoy it along the way. Um, always document your sources, which we know if you're looking at something, and also remember to cite your sources. And in some of the um, handouts that we're gonna have, to the back of the room and then also available on our website will help you trace what you have researched. I don't know about you, but sometimes I, in the past, have gone to a repository and, and realized that I've actually looked at the same record several times. And I said to myself, if I had done what I should have done and written it down, I would have saved myself time and effort. But, you know, to err is human. Um, most dates are appro uh, approximate, that's, that's fine. And if you're unsure about something, don't be afraid to say that you're unsure. If you know, you're not sure about dates, times, places, and so forth, just can keep your investigation hat on and keep going on. You can't do it all online. And I think some of the joy that we have certainly um, comes from finding things online and then sharing, but also, going to repositories or being in a group like this and helping each other out uh, discover. We had a gal in our Irish genealogy group a couple of weeks ago, and she's very involved in Scottish research, and she gave us something really to think about. She gave two examples of how she found items that she never would have found out about her Irish roots in Scottish records, tying things together. together. Um, Pass along your research. Well, it's easier said than done sometimes, isn't it? Um, find the methods that work for you and your family. Um, my grandson happens to be very interested in the American Revolution, so I've caught him that way. And because I'm a DAR, it's, it's kind of a natural thing for us to talk about. And uh, not last year, 2021, I did a scrapbook, which is over there on my mother's side. And I talked to him about our it, Peasley, it was a Marshall relative who was at Lexington and Concord. I got him, you know, but it, it, he's 27 now, so it took some time, right? Um, don't die with your stories still in you. Tell the stories, find a way that you can convey information. My daughter, one of my daughters likes to have um, the Peasley, the Moonies, all their coat of arms, and that, that's her thing. So you know what, do what? Do what uh, makes sense to you. Um, DNA is not a trump card. Um, sometimes it will help you, sometimes it won't, but use it as a tool. As they say, have your toolbox and have different tools in that toolbox. And anything you post online will be borrowed. I, I used to be upset about that. I'm not upset about it anymore. <laughs> I got past it. You had it. to let it go. Right? I, I had to let it go. 
so I just want to mention, first of all, thank you to the Wolfboro Public Library for letting us use their facility. They're just so fantastic and supportive. Thank you to the fellow directors here who are just in, so enthusiastic and happy about helping people. Uh, just a quick thing, have a lot of patience. Technically, there are lots of different kinds of evidence, direct evidence that addresses the matter at hand and offers an answer. We love those answers. There's also indirect evidence that does not provide a very specific answer, but may support or refute evidence. Uh, when accumulated, it can convince, if you pull those items together, some indirect evidence, you may be able to come to a conclusion. Uh, many of us have to write analyses when we're looking at lineage societies. Um, so direct evidence is very, indirect evidence is very important as you're accumulating it. Also is important is negative evidence to be able to disprove something, okay? And before I go on, I just want you to, to know that this PowerPoint is already on the Wolfboro Public Library website. It's under the genealogy section, so it is there. So don't feel like you have to take notes as we go along. Okay. So where do I begin? You always begin by stating in very concrete terms what you want to accomplish. Be specific. And an example of that is, I want to discover when and where my maternal great-great-grandparents arrived, when and where, arrived in the United States. Or I want to trace my ex-family back to their home country. We all get caught up in saying, oh, I'm going to do research, and then we end up having it be so wide. Start one place and know what your destination needs to be. S start with what you do know. And if Elaine were on the Zoom, she'd be talking about this. You always start with what you do know, which is yourself. Use a family group sheet. And there are some examples. This is an example. I have some, uh, some samples over there for you to take. This is also on our Lakes Region Genealogy website. Who here knows how to get to that? Okay, if you don't know how to get to it, come and see me, and at the end of the session, we'll bring it up and show you, okay? We have a lot of forms in there that you can download and you can print if this is the way that you would like to do it. You have your own style. Chronicle yourself and research backwards, because guess what? You are the easiest to find information on, and success breeds happiness, and we all want to be happy in our genealogy. Tell a few relatives what you're doing. Okay, this could be a loaded thing. Um, <laughs> and you can use a family questionnaire worksheet also on our website, if possible, to capture details. Um, I reunited with a cousin about 10 years ago. She relocated from Virginia up to Vermont, and all of a sudden we were best friends again. And that's wonderful. She was willing to take that family questionnaire, and her mother is was my mother's sister. I learned so much about my mother from her because my mother died when I was young. So those really those questionnaires at different times of the lifespan of us can be very, very helpful. And to this day, I am so thankful to her that she was willing to give me that information. As a result of that, we actually went to Plymouth State, Plymouth State College and found, I knew that her mother had also graduated from Plymouth Teachers College at the time, and they had yearbooks. It was a treasure trove. So talk to your family. You'd be surprised what you might learn. Talking to Aunt Marjorie, I had an elder aunt, Aunt Marjorie, and I knew that she was the second wife of my uncle, and she actually was open when she was in assisted living to be able to talk to me about that and also gave me a lot of information about the two siblings that I didn't know. So, you know, be opportunistic. Find patterns with names, locations, and hidden tips. If looking at a census record, look for neighbors who, may, who might be relatives. And I'll show you a slide. And don't worry about surname variations. I mean, that was the first thing that I got hung up when I was looking at my Peasley family. The names kept changing, and the Daigle Douglas, and so forth. And a lot of people that came to the United States 
changed their last names because they wanted to be Americans. All right. So, not that you have to see this close up, but when I was looking for my, my Mooney family, um, I was actually up here seeing my fifth great-grandfather, John, his wife, Eunice, who was also call, called Una, and Unity. Different records, different first name. You know, it threw me off. But anyhow, I knew this was them because of the son, Hugh. I came down here, and I knew that John Mooney's mother's last name was McLaughlin. That was the one clue that I had. And this, I don't know if you can see the arrow, but that tied things in for me. Doesn't mean that it was initially, I said, is this, I'm a doubting Thomas, but is this really the right one? And it turns out that it was. So look for those, those clues. And while we're talking about clues, over um, on the table, we think about vital records, we think about baptismal records, we think about census records, but this list by Family Tree Magazine is so wonderful because I get caught up in the box of, oh, census records, vitals, this, that. And there are so many other items that you can pull in, uh, as we say, Bible records, manufacturing surveys, city directories. I'll be showing you some of those. So. These, this particular list is over there, and it's also on our website. Okay, so we found Mary McLaughlin's uh, relatives. Records and keeping track. There are so many different ways that you can do this. And when I began my research on, I'd done Peasley's and joined a lineage society, Sons and Daughters of the First Settlers of um, Newbury in Massachusetts, they they provided me the template that I had to follow. That was great. I knew what I had to do and I followed it. When I, when I went to the Moonies, I had no templates. So I started this book over here. Watch me. <laughs> Jake's good. <laughs> this is what I did on the Moonies. I started a binder and I used the family record sheet generation. I started with who I knew that had come in by naturalization records. And so you can come over here and take a look at it. This was before I used a software program called Family Tree Maker. Um, and so subsequent, when I started to go to the technology, I said, what am I gonna do? So I took out the vital records and the things that were most important. I scanned them and I attached them in the program. You could do that at Family Search, right? ancestry, and I said, how am I going to remember what I've done? So on the right-hand side, if I scanned something, I put an S at the very top of it. So when I look in here, I can see what I've done and what is where, okay? So kind of the original type of record. I'm going to just point out that when I go to a repository, um, whether it's in Boston or Concord, I go to Vital Records. If I'm researching, and this happens to be my Moonies, who were down in Boston, Lemonster, Cambridge, um, and then went to Vermont, I have folders on things that I am researching. And so uh, this portable mechanism is just wonderful for me because if I'm rushed I will forget to bring something that I'm going to be working on. So I recommend if you like this process, instead of you know binders and so forth, you can certainly do folders. I do green because it's Irish, okay? <laughs> While we're over here, I just want to show you, this is my Bible for New England research. Um, I actually bought it from NEHGS in Boston. It's, uh, it's the sixth edition. And if I'm doing research for anyone else or even on a, my family, this is my Bible. So find the Bibles that work for you. And I also want to mention that the library here has Family Tree Magazine. And I happen to subscribe because Dee was the one that told me I should. <laughs> it's really true. And it's just so fantastic because it gives you cheat sheets and every month, that you get a, 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 a magazine, they feature one state. So if I'm working on Rhode Island, they also give you at the back 
the list of the states and what edition they're in. So use your library resources. But a number of resources. Um, use what works for you, whatever you're comfortable with. You can check out our forms. Again, this is on the, on the PowerPoint, but we'll also show that at the end. Uh, use a family group sheet, generation one, generation two, generation three, et cetera. If you're familiar with Google Sheets or Excel and you're focusing in on residences, when I was trying to solve my Mooney dilemma, do you know how many John Mooneys there were in Boston? In the 1800s, a lot of them. So I actually used an Excel spreadsheet. I was down at NEHGS, American Ancestors, and I went through the city directories and I put everything in an Excel spreadsheet. It started making sense when I would find the same address, especially John and his son. So that's another thing that you can uh, kind of use as uh, I can show you the Mooney directory worksheet at the end. Free forms, they're everywhere. The research wiki, oh my gosh, if you're looking for information, there's an area there you can go and look at their forms and say, okay, this one's gonna work for me. This is, this is what I'm working on right now. I need this form and I'm gonna use it because it's going to help me, again, the funnel. You know, you're looking here, you wanna narrow down and be specific about what you are researching at the time. Um, I have information in here and, and Irish roots as well. Okay, then we talk about saving. Where and how will I save what I have found? There's so many options. We talked about the binders. I set mine up by family name, but I scan. Use a software program. Uh, our group has had some uh, sessions on Roots Magic. They have a free, um, a free program that you can use. Family Search is marvelous, free to sign up. And you know, remember that a lot of the information that we find in Ancestry and other online items, are, they're entered by volunteers. So be a little dubious about things. Say, you know, how does this match up with what I found, okay? Um, and watch out for duplicate individuals and families. I found that a lot in Ancestry when I'm looking. I see, oh, I, this family is here over and over and over. Um, in Ancestry, now I should say in Family Search, living individuals are privatized, which is really wonderful. In Ancestry, you can set up your own privacy settings, which I think is important, depending upon what you're going to be sharing. If keeping paper files, use different colors to identify family surnames, lines, and have a portable file, as I showed you. If you're using your laptop or desktop, where are you saving your information? I have to admit, when I first started out, mine was scattered, and I had to come up with a process and a protocol that would help me be able to go back in and find what I needed to find. So I use documents and I have a subfolder called genealogy and then I set it up by family name. Well then you get your family name and then under that I will do generation one, two, three, four, five and I name the generation. So in my case, my generation one was John Mooney because I knew he came into the United States. You set that up the way that it works for you. Just remember, your brain, your mind is a little different than mine. So follow your own path, but just be consistent, okay? Keep family stories you have written in a separate subfolder, such as XYZ family stories. Same with cemetery photos, family photos, et cetera. And you will see in this one, which is a newer binder that I'm doing, because I, like I like to start and do it that way and enter into Family Tree Maker as I go. I have cemetery photos in there. I'm big on cemeteries, I have to admit. I like to go, and as Jeffra knows, you know, cleaning cemetery stones is really important as well. Um, but the rule of three, keep a hard copy only for what is very important or difficult to recreate. Two, scan or save to your laptop or PC. And I mentioned about how I did that over time. Okay. Back up your folders on a thumb drive or external drive or save to the cloud for posterity. 
There's Dropbox, Google Drive, programs like Carbonite. I happen to use Carbonite because I do more than genealogy. And my operating system last year crashed. And I was so glad I had Carbonite. And that is in almost real time. So it's there. You don't have to think about it. And it cost me about $100 a year. And it's, you know, when I, I paid a lot of money for my laptop, I have a lot of information. $100 a year, not to sneeze at, but it is, it's important to me. But there are other, as I say, Dropbox, Google Drive, and so forth. And you can look online ideas, family search at this link. And when you, if you download this uh, PowerPoint, you're going to be able to click on that link and it will take you right there. All right, what next? Your research. Obviously, complete all of your research first, because that's easier to find. Find your ancestors in every US and, and state census records and online documents, and use Family Search Wiki to locate those state census information. Remember that town, county, and state boundaries have changed over time. That's a tricky one. Look into city and town directories. Tap into town annual reports for birth, marriage, and death information. I've spent many hours at the New Hampshire State Library and so disappointed that some of the smaller towns have nothing. However, we learn as we go. And the researchers and the research librarians at the State Library in Concord are ecstatic to help you if you're doing e beyond New Hampshire. I actually send them emails. Charles is one of the research librarians. Have you worked with him? No? He's, he's excited when I send him an email. Norma, I'm so glad to hear from you. Let me help you with this. And oftentimes, it has nothing to do with New Hampshire. So don't, don't think that you're siloed that way. Okay. I gave you an example in here of, and we can take a look at that if we have plenty of time. I want to make sure we have lots of time for questions and, and demonstrations here. Learn about occupations. What did they do? What I said, what is a boilermaker? And Marie Daly down in Boston said to me, that was a very good vocation, especially for second and third generations who came and the parents were laborers. And a boilermaker was a very good vocation, made very good money. And it turns out that that boilermaker, excuse me, boilermaker, Mooney, worked for a company that during the Civil War, moved to Canada and made, guess what? Boilers for the South. And I wondered why I couldn't find my great-great-grandfather born in 1964. Couldn't find him in the United States. Then in the census records, on one census only, it said he was born in Canada. So how long it took me to get that information? Years, years and years. But if I hadn't really t taken a look at the Boilermaker occupation and asked questions, I wouldn't have connected the dots. Obviously, review your marriage, birth, and death records. Seek your clues, baptismal records, godparents, witnesses, family Bibles, and use the FAN method, friends, associates, neighbors. Once you locate the country of origin, learn about migration patterns. And then you can go to the family search, research Ricky. It's just amazing when you go in there and you're looking for Scotland or Bavaria. Or I was working with a gentleman here in Wolfboro um, whose family came from the Azores. And I said, I know nothing about the Azores. And he was planning a trip. And he and his wife went two years ago, to the Azores, and he was able with me to actually, we went to the research wiki, pulled up information, maps, found out that there was a family history center there, voila, you know, and we also found some other things online, but that, without that resource, I don't know, I, I certainly wasn't in a position to help him. Lots of free resources. Uh, Dee's group, recently, uh, the Family History Guide, the sessions that you had, um, that link is also on the Wolfboro Library website under genealogy. Amazing, amazing. Uh, Cindy's List has been around for many, many years. A lot of us go to Cindy's List. 
looking for passengers list, you know, lots of things that you can find there. Get comfortable. Um, and, and it's okay if you don't remember why you went there in the first place. <laughs> it happens to all of us. Um, archives.gov. Um, and don't be afraid to use your local library, either in person or the internet. And as we know, um, a lot of the libraries have the Ancestry Library Edition. They have family, their family affiliates with Family Search, et cetera. So resources that we might not be able to have at home. Um, and just a reminder that the Wolfboro Public Library carries the Family Tree magazine. Okay. Other resources. School records, we had a session a few years ago about yearbooks that are now proliferating on ancestry, et cetera. And it's interesting, I found a lot of my cousins who are still alive, and I found their <laughs> senior pictures, which were great. Um, it kind of precipitated some conversations because we lived far apart, um, and they had stories that they could tell me about Oh yes, I played the saxophone like my mother. Those kinds of things which give meaning to the stories that you're building. Um, obviously newspapers for obituaries, marriage announcements. I use in the, my DAR research a lot of obituaries to tie families together, to tie those generations together because sometimes you have nothing else to, to locate at that point. The Library of Congress has Chronicling America. For major newspapers, it's free. Newspapers.com, which we know is a subscription. Um, Cindy's List. And what we do, and I think a lot of your friends might be in the same uh, group, if you have a group of people that you like to talk genealogy with, you might not want to subscribe to five different paid s websites. What we do in DAR is we say, Round table, okay, I'll, I'll do full three. Someone else does newspaper, someone else does find my past, and we help each other out. Um, and it builds a lot of confidence and camaraderie. So don't, don't be hesitant to you know, form your own little group of friends that like to help each other out. Obviously using Google, I will say that with some of my, uh, I, I donate some of my time to a women's club, and it's all genealogy. And um, quite frankly, I encourage them with me to actually go into Google and look for s books, uh, different types of things. We've found um, memoirs about some family members. We've found books written about families that they're related to that tie in marriage-wise. So that's always a bonus. Worldcat.org will help you locate books and publications in libraries that are near you. This library may not have what the book that you need. The state library might not. But University of New Hampshire Library sometimes has a, has a book that you can go and look at. Uh, so a lot of hints, et cetera, that way. Archives.gov for military records, as well as Fold3, which is subscription. And if you need access to images and family search that you can't view online, if your library is an affiliate, you can view more images than at the at-home version, or you can make an appointment to visit a family history center. And a number of us went to Exeter, where Jeffra spends quite a bit of her time, right? Um, just let us know when you want to come. We're open on Wednesdays and Saturdays or by other appointments. And sign up for a time. and. There's always people there that are willing to help you um, in your whatever you're researching. And they also have access to a lot of the subscription services, for example, like Fold3 or newspapers, all of those. You can access all of those for free at the Family History or Family Search Centers. Mm -hmm. We had a little group in the fall that went down, and it was such a great day. And you, fo you followed up, I think, with another trip, didn't you? Down. It, it was so meaningful. And what I love about it is to sit next to someone and they have a discovery. And they're so excited. It's, it's right, and two screens. That's right, the double screens. It's uplifting when you, not just you, have the successes, but someone that's next to you has a success. It 
boosts all of us. We also, um, at the Exeter Family History, Family Search Center, we have access to digitize, um, well, like here at the, at the library, there is the um, photo scanner to be able to digi digitize your photos or documents. We have that also in Exeter, but we also have to make videos like VHSs into um, digital format or slides into digital format as well. So it's incredible lots resources. Of access and research, oh. resources to do a lot of things there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. So the next slide may be a little dated, but it gave an this you can tell me if there are things that are not there anymore, but it's amazing what is available um, in Exeter, et cetera, that you know you might not have access to or you would have to pay to have access to. Okay. So I think I've completed my US research. What's next? Did you find an immigration record or ship manifest via your research? Many records were from the port of departure, not the arrival. Was there a naturalization record? How many people here have found a naturalization record? Did that change what you did from that point on? More information. Mm -hmm. um, again, I can't say this enough. The research wiki, familysearch.org, will open many doors for you. In our Irish group, when I showed them how to go into Ireland, it was amazing the plethora of information that was there just for their taking. I talked a little bit about um, narrowing down by country and specific documents you're seeking. The Azores example, that was amazing to me how much I could help Larry and his wife get ready for their trip. Um, that was the example of where I found the information on the Azores, which I'm not a very good student of geography, so I needed the the help. Um, search for databases specific to the nationality. Um, also, if you are on Facebook, Facebook has many, many groups that are very specific to counties, to you know, different topics that are going to help you. Surnames uh, in our Irish group. Uh, we talked last time about a, an Irish surname Facebook page that helped and you can go in and you can actually search by the surname that you are interested in and it will bring up all of the items that other people have entered. Okay, there are also many county, you know, uh, like County Donegal where my family was from. Um, I'm on that one. It led me to a Doherty that I've now connected with. So it's, it's amazing those little things that can help you um, connect. Heritage groups on Facebook Subscribe to Family Tree Magazine, which is Yankee Publishing, which is nice. Cindy's List, as I talked about. Join a local study group or start one. <laughs> and let us know. <laughs> We'd love to help you facilitate it. Um, and the library, again, is so, so helpful. And as we know, attend webinars and Zoom meetings to pick up tips. Um, I have to confess, I probably attend way too many webinars. Um, and you know what they say about attending an educational seminar? Are you like a 10 percenter? Only about 10 percent actually take the information from the webinar and use it practically. So I take a lot of notes. I try to be at least a 10 or 15 percenter. <laughs> Doesn't always work. DNA testing is genetic genealogy an answer and are you ready? We know, and even in our groups, that DNA has been very helpful. We have a number of people, um, attendees, who have shared their stories. I have two stories of my own on my family side, on both of my mother's and my father's side, of children who were adopted and they were seeking their biological mother or dad. And they found my niece, who found, well, she, she did 23 and Me. I did not, but she referred the gentleman to me. And he expanded his DNA, uploaded it to GEDmatch. We saw how I was related, and then we did the sleuthing from there. And both on both the woman from Vermont, she was able to find her biological father. 
And then the gentleman who was actually in Mexico was able to find, uh, unfortunately his biological mother was deceased, but he discovered a full brother and a half brother, half sibling through DNA. So it can be helpful. Um, obviously you can locate a lot of siblings, uh, excuse me, a lot of cousins as we found out from Roots Tech. Those of us that got the alerts, you have 43,000 cousins and so forth. Um, <laughs> and then you narrow those down. Um, one of the things that, that I don't have in here, which is relatives in the room. Have, have some of you done that, relatives in the room? Okay. Relatives around me. Re relatives around me? Okay. So we did this a few years ago at one of our sessions over at the church. And it was wonderful if you have the Family Search app, and you, I think within 50, is it 50 feet of another person, and if there's a match, you will find cousins in the room or relatives in the room. And it was eye-opening, because most of us had relatives in the room that we didn't know about. So that's another thing that we might want to do another time uh, as a group. It's fun. If you locate matches, those individuals may have completed a family tree. And certainly, if you look at ancestry and others, some do, some do not. Um, have any of you in this group actually been either contacted by or contacted someone that you had a DNA match with? Yeah. Um, as we know, um, it's not an answer by itself necessarily, but helpful in some cases. And there are so many very good sessions on YouTube, beginner sessions on using DNA, GEDmatch. That's how I learned. I didn't, I read the, I, I did read Blaine Bettinger's book. It's a little deep for me, um, I have to say. Um, but, you know, I've learned enough to be able to upload to GEDmatch and um, I was able to upload my dad's as well, which led to one of the cousins and so forth. And always be respectful of another person's desire not to talk about it. What will happen to my records? Well, you put a lot of time and effort into your research. I look at my binders and say, okay, where will they go? <laughs> the daughters aren't quite there yet. You know, they're interested, they like to hear the stories, but they're not sure, so sure they want the, the, all the boxes and so forth. Um, but I was fortunate. What led me to find out a lot about my Peasley family was I went to the New Hampshire Historical Society one day on a whim. I had a few hours and I went into the, the library and I was just talking to one of the, the librarians and she said, we have, a, we have this box of Peasley stuff, but it's an LEE. -E. And I said, well, L-E-E, L-E-Y, um, I don't know. So she took me over and showed me what the box was. I pulled it out. And ironically, it was from Joseph Peasley, first settler of Newbury, Mass, up to my mother's generation, but my mother was not in there. Her older brother and sister were in there. And this woman, her name was Avery, from Virginia, had done all of this research, typed, everything was typed or handwritten, and the binder was, it was this large, and I sat there absorbed for hours, and it just opened up everything to me. I didn't know Joseph, I didn't know all of that history, and honestly, this is the result of it right here, and I finished that in 2010. Um, it took me about two years to do all of the, you had to get all of the documents and so forth. I couldn't rely on her type notes. But every, every library that I went to, Newbury, Newburyport, they were fantastic. And I didn't even know that the Lineage Society existed until I talked to a number of people about it. So that was exciting for me. And it's led to, as in your case, I mean, how many great-grandparents do you have? It goes out and out and out. And for me, it's Marshall, Morse's, et cetera. Um, and I just happen to enjoy the process. Do all of you enjoy the process? Yeah, yeah, yeah. OK. So you know, I, I've thought about this and said, well, you know, I'm not so sure, that the, so sure that the Historical Society is going to be interested in this. But at some point, I will go back there. I've become a member. And I will talk with them about 
more important things, not just necessarily the fact that I have you know, copies of the pages in the books and so forth, but what would be meaningful. And uh, so I, I kind of did a little bit of research. And there is such a thing as a genealogy codicil that you can put in your will. Does anyone have one or know of them? Yes? Yep. Um, and if I haven't uploaded that, I certainly will. I have to double check and see. I have a blank uh, template for it. And you can actually, well, first of all, you should talk to the person that you're going to leave the items to to make sure they want them, right? <laughs> <laughs> that might be the first thing you want to do. But that you can actually have a codicil to your will that states where you want those records to go and what to do with them if that person or persons don't want them. So, okay. A share up front with those who are named. <laughs> <laughs> or speak with your local historical society to see if their rep rep repositories will hold your books. How many of you have gathered books? The town of Ware, the town of Hillsborough, the town of this. And you have those, and they're valuable. Um, and your family might not want the books, but your historical societies might want them. So to wrap up, um, something that came to me afterwards, I was on a seminar, and I did my five or ten percent, you know, taking away. Um, and this was something that was discussed, which is use a genealogy workflow to keep organized. We all need to have help, right? Use the research plan document, research the plan review, you review what you're going to do, search for the needed records, source citations again, so you remember what you looked at and where you found it. Read and analyze the record. How many times have you have you had a record, you went back two years later, looked at it, and you found different information. Our lenses change over time, which is, I think, very important to remember. Download the records if you're on online, file it the way that you want to, add the record to your family tree if applicable, repeat the above process for each record, and at the end of each research session, review the findings and update the research plan. And I think the last thing I would say is that you deserve to have the time to do the research that you want to do. Don't let life get in the way. And it's so easy with our families and all of the, everything that goes on in our lives to say, well, I'll get to that tomorrow. I'll get to that tomorrow. And you know what? You deserve to take the time to pursue your passion with genealogy. So um, I'd like to show you on the library's website. How many, of you, how many of you are familiar with the Wolfboro Library website and where the information is? Okay. So, so everyone can see Wolfboro Public Library. And what you want to do is go to Library Services and Resources. And here you are, Genealogy Resource, Resources. And They've done such a nice job. Jeannie does uh, most of the work on the website. And over time, um, we have been able to add recordings here. So I'm going to click on that in a second. But you can also see that you have access to Heritage Quest. They have Family Search, and it talks a little bit about uh, what that is uh, available. And also in-house, the Ancestry Library Edition is available in the library only. And here's what Dee spoke about, which is the family history guide, and a, a link, a hot link right there. So you can see here, you just click on that. Gray Finder, a um, lot of work been done, a lot of work has been done here on scan, I believe it's scanning the Wolfboro postcards. I personally have not looked at those, but they're here. So feel free to go in here to watch. Some are recordings and some are just PowerPoints. So tonight's PowerPoint is right here. You can click on it, and you can download it. So it's there for you to use. There are a variety of others that here. German immigrants, uh, <laughs> information about the Exeter History Center. We had a presentation on that, and our 10-year anniversary presentation, Cemetery Stories by Virginia Hansen. Thank you. So again, the PowerPoint is here. If you have questions, to find it, you go to Library Services and Resources and go down to Genealogy 
resources, and your selection is right here if you want to watch or see the PowerPoints. Okay, and we're very fortunate tonight. We have Wolfboro Public Television here. Our friend Jake, who is excellent with technology and walked us through <laughs> many hiccups. <laughs> we thank them for coming and they will be taking this and editing it um, and posting it and online, online. So thank you for coming. Um, I appreciate that.